Hey, what's up? I'm DJ Sixsmith. You're watching The Sit Down. The only good Indians, brand new book from this guy, Stephen Graham Jones. How are you, sir? I'm great. It's wonderful to be here. Thanks for having me. You got it. So you've been writing books for a long time. You love to explore the drama, the horror, a little bit of everything. What made this book a little bit different from the rest? What made this book different was that it came in three parts. Books usually have a like a single push the whole way through, and this one goes in three hitches, like a triple jumper, you know? What was the biggest challenge of putting it together, given that? The biggest challenge putting it together was getting all the the hunting stuff right, I think, because I, I, I can fake it on cars. I can fake it on people, but um, I got to get it right for the hunters, you know? <laughs> yeah, the hunters are probably going to be pretty pissed off if you get it wrong. You got you to nail it for that group. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Uh, so you have a really interesting writing style from what I read about. Who are some of your biggest inspirations? Like, how did you kind of form your style over the years? You know, Louise Erdrich is one of my heroes. Everything she does is golden as far as I'm concerned. Philip K. Dick, I love the sincerity with which he wrote, that he was always trying to save his own life on the page, it felt like. And I love the irreverence of Kurt Vonnegut. I wish I could, or I aspire to do something equally as irreverent, you know? Do you have a favorite Vonnegut book? You know, yeah, it's probably Sirens of Titan. Yeah. How about you? You got one? Yeah, I mean, we yeah. only did a little bit of Vonnegut during school, you know? It yeah. Like Slaughterhouse-Five yeah. was kind of it. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, but yeah. that's a perfect example of somebody I'd love to explore more of. And Philip Dick's yeah. the same way, where it's like, you kind of get a little sprinkling of these people over the years. And, and you know it, too, like you're a professor mm -hmm. of English for all these years mm -hmm. in Colorado. Like, you only get exposed mm -hmm. to a certain number of writers, and then other people get kind of left by the wayside. So... Yeah. How do you think we kind of push through and getting all different types of writers in the mix? You know, you, you kind of just got to be fastidious in your, like, well, I, you don't do what I did with Vonnegut, say. When I found Vonnegut when I was 21 years old, mm -hmm. I, I loved it. And so six weeks later, I'd read every Vonnegut. And yeah. for the rest of my life, I have no more Vonnegut, you know? <laughs> so the, the trick <laughs> is the trick is just to pull from all the shelves. That, that's, that, that's what I try to do still today. I'm almost 50 years old, and I try to pull from all the shelves. I'm reading... Right now, three different books, and they're from shelves that don't even touch, you know? That's really cool. Yeah, I just read The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. I had yeah. never done that one before. Yeah. And so yeah. I'd only done Beloved. Like, that's a great example. Expose yourself to a little more. Like, until yeah. last year, I hadn't read any James Baldwin. And I'm like, I got to expose myself to this whole different world. Because, like, yeah. there's so much great stuff out there. And, like, sometimes mm -hmm. we just get pumped the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. and you forget mm -hmm. that there's all this great stuff out there, including yeah. your stuff as well. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So, uh, given everything that's going on right now, mm -hmm. when it comes to your book, what do you think about the fact that you're releasing this story with everything going on in the world right now? You know, I think it was kind of fortunate, or I don't know if fortunate's the right word. I, so it felt weird that this book came out one day after the Washington Redskins said that they're going to change their name, you know, which I'm thrilled about, of course. Yeah. I, was, I was always quite insulted by that. And, um, and yeah, I mean, the world is changing right now. And I'm not, I'm not at all saying that my book is um, part of that, but I think the whole world is being swept ahead with the change. And my book is just part of that world being swept ahead, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's a really fascinating year for a number of different reasons, but you, mm -hmm. you mentioned the Washington football team. It's like indigenous people have been wanting this name out of the way for decades. Right. Yeah. And then yeah. a few companies get involved, put a little pressure on. Now we're going to get a name change. So, Obviously, I'm right there with you. Like, this name needs to be changed. But what does it mean to you to actually see real concrete change happening in 2020? It feels like a step forward, you know? And it feels like a not necessarily a first step forward, maybe like a second or third step forward. But I think there's still a lot of steps to go, you know? I agree. Yeah, what does it mean to you just to represent Indigenous people with your work? Because honestly, yeah. like, it's just a lot has been forgotten over the years in terms of history, yeah. in terms of narratives. You know, what does that yeah. mean to you? It means a lot. One of my goals is I want to show the world American Indians that they don't expect, you know, they expect us to still be like in the 19th century, you know, wearing loincloths and, and living in, in lodges and stuff. But um, it's not it's not like that anymore. We we're not locked in a John Wayne movie. We're moving ahead, you know, and that's a big part about what of, that's a big part of what the Olympic Indians is about to me anyways. Yeah, just to humanize and to normalize. And it's crazy to think, but like those movies like are still what people are thinking about in so many different ways. Oh, yeah. And like, especially the way that people think of John Wayne, it's like, that's so, so long ago and it's not representative of what's going on. And I'm sure not it's an extremely frustrating thing to have to deal with. Yeah, no, you're, you're totally right. It's, it's representative of what 
the American colonial myth making machine wants to believe in, I guess, you know. <laughs> Definitely. So mm -hmm. I mentioned before that you're an English professor as well in mm -hmm. terms of everything you do. What's it been like being an English professor at the college level and just trying to impact minds, mm -hmm. especially at that point in the lives of a lot of different kids? You know, it's it's an honor to get to like not sculpt lives. I don't I don't really put myself on that kind of pedestal, but just to kind of nudge somebody this way or that way. You know, when I when I see my students two or three years after they've graduated and they're in publishing or they're in comic books or, or they're making their way into TV, then um, I think I don't I feel proud of them, but um, I feel like they're doing it on their own too. All I did was just nudge them in a certain direction. You know, it's nice when you have a teacher that nudges you in that direction. And it's funny too because like the irony is like when you major in English or you study English, people are like, "What are you going to do with your life?" And just being yeah. a storyteller in all its different forms is so critical. So. What does it mean to you that your students are going on and doing TV and doing publishing and just telling stories in ways we haven't seen before? Oh, it, I mean, narrative is one of the basic things we need to get along with in the world. And so if I can help people understand better how narrative works, all narrative is is selection of events to kind of push a certain argument. Like if, if I want to believe something about myself, then I'll go back and cherry pick something from when I was seven, something from when I was 12, something from when I was 19, and I'll add that together into a version of myself that I can believe in and, and like live, live in, I guess. And I think if my students can go out with a solid sense of narrative, then they can infect the world with that. And the world becomes better the more it understands how to manipulate narrative, I think. Yeah, and we could certainly use some new narratives also. Like, I think we've mm -hmm. tried to reboot everything at this point, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. what do you think about the idea of like, you know, one day people taking this book or some of your other stuff mm -hmm. and turning it into, you know, something on TV or in film or something yeah. like that? That you know, it'd be wonderful to me because they would have to get American Indian actors and that would right. get people, that would get people work. And that would get, um, there would be some seven-year-old sitting out there in a living room looking at a television and seeing a version of themselves on the screen and they would feel that loop of connection and that that would mean everything to me. Yeah, I've, I've talked about this with a, a lot of different people, just seeing somebody on a TV screen that looks like them and the American Indian group is probably the one group where that still doesn't happen. So like mm -hmm. even for you, like who are the people that you did look to throughout your childhood? You know, the people I looked, through, looked to through my childhood, turns out that they weren't really American Indian. I would look to um, like, um, Lou Diamond Phillips playing Chicote on Young Guns. You know, he was probably one of the most, the first and the loudest Indians that I connected with. And I mean, he's just a dude playing an Indian. He plays him really well, of course. And before that, it was reading Louis L'Amour. He had a lot of American Indians in his stuff. He had a certain one, Joe Mack, I believed in. The first time I ever read an Indian on the page was in Hal Borland's novel, When the Legends Die. And, um, it, it was a white guy writing the Indian, but I didn't know that. I, I, I didn't know that you could write about Indians. It's so magic to me reading about someone from the time they were young, young until they were like 35 or 40, that I got to see a whole life cycle. And it, it gave me like a sense of what's coming for me, or I could believe in a future anyways. And that was really important. Yeah, it's really beautifully said. Just being able to write about whoever you want to write about. And also just, if you're going to represent a certain people on TV or, or in novels, mm -hmm. like actually have that person from that group represent that group. Like it's uh, such a simple thing, but like we haven't understood that for such a long time, right? I know, it's ridiculous. I, I can't understand why it didn't happen. Uh, it's crazy, man. So mm -hmm. when people pick up your book, and I think it's going to be a fascinating escape, what are some things you want them to be thinking about feeling when they read through your words? I want them to be thinking about things they might have done in their own past for which a spirit of vengeance might be dogging them now. You know, that's what the story is about. It's about four guys who make a bad call in the field one day when they're hunting elk. And then 10 years later, a spirit of vengeance comes to punish them for that. And we've all done, we've all done things we regret, of course, you know, things that we think we got away with, but did we really get away with them? Or is something going to circle back around for us? You know. Yeah, definitely a lot to chew on there. Looking forward to reading mm -hmm. it. Steven, nice to meet you, man. Thanks so much for jumping on and be well, all right? Take it easy, man. Thanks.